Hey everybody, this is Pastor Tyler Baker of Valiant Baptist Church, and we are located in the Jacksonville, Florida area. So I'm coming to you with a video on the subject of eternal security, the assurance of the believer, also known as once saved, always saved. And I wanna answer the question uh, that many people will raise and ask, and that is, can you lose your salvation? Can a saved person, or once you are saved, can you lose your salvation? Now the answer to that, the biblical answer to that is no. Once you are saved, according to the Bible, you are always saved. Now, this can be proven from, from many different aspects. Uh, you know, the Bible is real clear that it's eternal life. It's everlasting life. That at the moment that you're saved, you're passed from death unto life. That's why it's saved with a D on it, past tense. It's already done. There's nothing to worry about. Uh, not only that, you know, Jesus says uh, uh, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. No man can pluck us out of his hand. He says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You know, he teaches that his water is not like physical water, that once you drink of it, you'll never thirst again, uh, that you only need to take one bite of the bread. You know, it, salvation's a one-time event. We're born again. We're not born again and again and again. Uh, you know, uh, there are so many different ways to teach this. The Holy Spirit seals us unto the day of redemption, according to the Bible. Now, I could go on and on about all the different ways. I mean, you could preach numerous sermons about that. But I want to deal with a specific question on this subject, even more specific, that I'm asked all the time. We go door to door here at Valiant Baptist Church and we preach the gospel weekly. And uh, I mean, it seems like almost every other person, you know, uh, uh, you know, if not every other person, at least one out of four will ask this exact question that I'm about to pose right now. Once they understand the gospel of grace, that it truly is just by faith and salvation occurs in a moment. And once you're saved, you're always saved and they do nothing. They just put all of their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that it doesn't matter how they live their life. It's not based on their righteousness. It's based on the death, burial, and resurrection. People always ask the same question, and that's this. Are you saying that once I'm saved, I can just live however I want? I could just do whatever I want, and I'll still get to heaven. And the answer to that question is yes, you could. Because once you are saved, you are saved forever no matter what. There are no exceptions. There is nothing you could do to lose your salvation. Nothing. Now, many people ask that question. I actually want to give you a, a very a, a biblical answer. I'm going to turn you to two scriptures that deal with this exact subject. I'm going to go to one place, Romans chapter number six, where the question is actually asked. This exact question is dealt with, and it speaks about this. The second place I'm going to go to is God actually talking about what he does and how he deals with people that are saved, and they decide just to live a sinful life, and they don't serve him and they don't obey his commandments. So I wanna answer this question for you. Share this video with, with those that maybe deal with this, that have asked this question maybe to you. I hope this can be a blessing to you, maybe to just sure you up in your own salvation if you're already saved. Uh, or maybe, like I said, it can be uh, good for someone else that you know. You can share this video with them and maybe help them to better understand the mercy and the grace of God and how, and how great God's grace actually is. I'm gonna begin, like I said, with Romans chapter number six. This is Paul writing and uh, he asked the question. He says this in Romans chapter number six, verse one, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So the question I want to focus on there, of course, is where it says this, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, the very uh, interesting thing about this particular verse and about this question is this, there is a presupposition to this. There is a uh, there is something that must first be true before you can even ask the question, and that is this: it must it must be possible first that you could continue in sin, and grace would abound in order to ask this question. It first must be true that you could continue in sin and grace would abound, or the question would be nonsensical. What Paul is asking is, should we or shall we just continue living a sinful life because grace abounds? And then he answers the question just to show that this isn't you know, uh, him, him just uh, asking a question for no reason or hypothetical that's actually not really possible. He answers the question in verse number two and he says, God forbid. God forbid. So notice that it is a legitimate question, but it first must be true that you could continue in sin and grace would abound. You know, it is true that you could. And he's actually bouncing off of something that he said in Romans chapter number five. Romans chapter number five, verse 20, he said, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So I want you to notice there that he teaches that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So however much you know we sin, of course, God paid for all of our sins. Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins and grace would continue to abound and would continue to pay for all of them. It's like the song, grace greater than our sin. So notice that 
that this passage actually teaches us and tells us that, in fact, you know, uh, we could continue in sin and grace would abound. Why? Because it's only by his mercy and grace that we're saved in the first place. It's only by trusting. It's not based on our works. It's not based on how we live our life. It's just based on the grace and the mercy of God. Now, the other passage I want to turn you to is found in Psalm chapter number 89. Psalm chapter number 89, and this is actually dealing with what is known as the sure mercies of David. It's referred to in the book of Acts, and it's actually uh, uh, revealed in the book of Acts that this is discussing uh, the covenant that God makes with Jesus. And this is the same covenant that we are able to enter into when we put our faith in Jesus. This is our covenant. It's the new covenant. It's the, the covenant uh, of grace. Now, here in uh, verse number 27 is where it begins uh, in Psalm 89. It says, also I will make him my firstborn. We're speaking of Jesus, higher than the kings of the earth. That you know, Jesus is the king of kings. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. Notice that. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. So he says his mercy will keep them forevermore, eternally. And he says, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Saying it's not going to be removed. It's, it's never going to be moved or shaken or changed. Verse 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Now, notice there, his seed, this is just a side note, his seed, whose seed? It's talking about Jesus' seed. Now, if, if, and this is, of course, speaking of Christians, if we are his children, then what does that make him to us? Well, that would make Jesus our father. You know, it makes sense why he's referred to as the everlasting father. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So uh, just a side note, but just to continue going there, verse number 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. So the same covenant that he makes with, with uh, Jesus, he makes with his seed or his children. Then he goes further and he says this, if, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes, and keep not my commandments. So of course, this is strong language, speaking about you know the, the seed of Jesus, speaking about Christians. If we decide to live a sinful life, and he uses strong language, this is a person that's completely forsook God, but they are a child of God. You know, they have been born again. You know, like Jesus said, uh, or, or like it says in John 1, as many as received him, uh, for as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So these are people that have put their faith in Christ, but they're, but they're living a sinful life. What is he going to do? It says this in verse 32. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod. So he's going to visit their sin with the rod. He's going to punish them and their iniquity with stripes. So he is going to punish us. But notice, he's not going to send us to hell. Look at verse 33. Nevertheless, that means even still, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. So he goes on to explain that he's not going to take his loving kindness utterly from us. And then he says this, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Now, what does that mean? His faithfulness, he's talking about his dependability. The fact that he's, a, he's faithful to his promise. He has promised us, what? That he's, gonna, he's going to cause us to endure forever. That, that uh, the, thr the throne will endure forever as the days of heaven. He goes on and explains it even more so. Verse 34, he says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. I want you to notice that. He says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. He's saying that I promised that they would endure forever. I promised that they would uh, you know, be as the, the days of heaven, that their throne would be as the days of heaven, and that I, I would keep my covenant and it would stand fast with him. Uh, and then he goes on further. He says in verse 35, once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. So he won't lie unto David. This is a prophetic, uh, uh, this is prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 36, his seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. So notice again, his seed shall endure forever. Why is it saying that? Because we are given everlasting life or we are given eternal life. Notice how he said, I will not lie unto David. This is like Titus 1-2. It says this, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie 
promised before the world began. I want you to notice that. It says that he cannot lie and he promised this before the world began in hope of eternal life. Now, what do we have to do to get eternal life? Well, Jesus said in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You know what we have to do? We just have to put our faith in Jesus. We have to trust in Jesus. And what happens at that moment is that we are saved. We are sealed. We are given eternal life. We are given everlasting life. And God cannot lie. He promised us. He promised us that if we believed in him, he would give us eternal life and everlasting life. So once we become a child of God, we're a child of God forever. Once we're saved, we're saved forever. And this actually answers the question. People will talk about this. Well, are you saying you can just do whatever you want and still get to heaven? You mean if I forsake his law and walk not in his, his, his commandments? I, you know, I don't keep his statutes. I don't walk in his judgments. You know, it says he keep, he, he, and keep not my commandments. What's he going to do? Yeah, he's going to punish me. He's going to visit my transgression with the rod and my iniquity with stripes. He's going to punish me. But is he going to take that covenant away? Is he going to take that promise away? Is he going to send me to hell? Is he going to take away my eternal life, my everlasting life? The fact that he said I would endure forever, that I would live forever? No, he's not going to. This ties in with Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 6, a very famous verse that's speaking about you know, the, uh, the punishment of a Christian, that if a child of God decides to live a sinful life, it tells us in Hebrews chapter number 12, Verse number six, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So what does he do? He punishes his children. He, he chastens and scourges them. Why does he do that? Because he loves us. And if we decide to live a sinful life, he will visit our transgression with the rod. He will visit our iniquity uh, with stripes. But will he take away our salvation? Will he, will he you know, uh, uh, cause his faithfulness to fail? Will he send us to hell? Will he cause us not to endure forever? Of course not. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Can you lose your salvation? No. And what if, what if a Christian decide to live a sinful life? Can you live however you want once you're saved and still get to heaven? Yes, you could. Because it's solely based on his grace and on his mercy. One of the greatest, you know, uh, a couple of verses in the Bible, Ephesians chapter number two, verse number eight and nine. Ephesians two, eight and nine, it says this, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of works. It's a gift. A gift is free. It's not of yourself. It's by grace. Grace is unmerited favor. If you lift a finger for it, you earned it. If you did anything for it, you earned it. The Bible is very clear that it's only based upon his mercy and his grace. Uh, Romans 3.28 is another great verse. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That means we're saved without love your neighbor. That means we're saved without, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not, you know, commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. That's not what saves us, keeping the law. None of that saves us. You know, should we continue in, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course not. We should obey God. Why? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We should keep his commandments because we love him. We should keep his commandments so we can be blessed by God, so that we're not punished by God while on this earth. But this is very important to understand uh, uh, because it, it ties in with the gospel of grace. You must understand that it's, it has nothing to do with how we live our lives. It has nothing to do with 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 how you know uh, 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 how much of a, of a righteous life that we live. It's based solely and one hundred percent upon His grace and upon His mercy that we are saved. So once again, asking the question: Are you saying that you could just do whatever you want and you would still go to heaven once you're saved? Yes, one hundred percent. Yes, you could. Once you are saved, you are always saved, no matter what no exceptions. God bless you and have a good day.